So our first speaker this semester is Asher Owl, who is uh, one of my colleagues in the mathematics department. He's a, he's a Gibbs assistant professor, uh, and um, he's great to have around, and you know, he does great math, and he's also a great kind of colleague and citizen, and uh, he was even willing to come here and, and uh, give a lecture when I asked him. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. Um, after the lecture, we'll have the usual, um, I mean, you're welcome to ask questions, we'll have the usual drawing for, for some swag or some you know, book, so stick around for that, and uh, enjoy. Thank you. So thanks for coming on a Sunday morning. I like to do math on Sunday mornings, but maybe that's not the usual. Um, actually, it's a real pleasure to give uh, this lecture at Math Mornings. I came the first semester I was here at Yale. I came to a Math Mornings event, and I was really blown away by the, the energy in the room, the type of excitement that was here. You can see it you know, in the pre-activities. It's actually, for this talk, it's really fun to see people playing uh, with, with building platonic solids or trying to build platonic solids. So um, it's really fun. I, I'm, I'm really glad to be giving this talk. OK, so I want to talk to you about symmetry and probably the first highly symmetric uh, geometrical object that we encounter in our lives is, um, is an equilateral triangle. So an equilateral triangle, it's a triangle where all the side lengths are equal. Um, and that's equivalent to the statement that the interior angles are all 60 degrees. Now, you say it's highly, or I say it's highly symmetric, but what does that mean? So you try to look for ways in which it appears to be symmetric. What does that even mean? So, for example, one way is you could kind of imagine drawing this line of symmetry here. So if you draw this line down the middle of the triangle and you think of folding the triangle across that line, you see that it, it meets up with itself. Okay, so not every shape has, you know, lines of symmetry. So, for example, if you take a rectangle, then this line which seems a very natural line, is not a line of symmetry, right? If you somehow fold it across that line, you get something like that, right? It, it doesn't quite fold up on itself. So that, that would not be a line of symmetry, but this one is. And there are a couple more if you notice them. So emanating from each uh, corner, there's a line of symmetry. So there are three of these kind of lines of symmetry. Okay, it's basically it. You can try to find any other ones, but that's all you're going to find. So what about any other types of symmetries? You can also rotate the triangle. Okay, so you can rotate by 120 degrees uh, to the right. You'll bring the triangle back to itself. You could rotate twice like that, rotate by 240 degrees, you also bring the triangle back to itself. Or you could think about roting, rotating in the other direction. But somehow, if you rotate once in the left to the left by 120 degrees, it's the same as rotating to the right by 240 degrees. So in some sense, if we want to just think of, if we want to enumerate the symmetries uh, of this equilateral triangle, we, we don't want to consider that rotating to the left or rotating twice to the right are different things. They're really the same thing. And so I ask you, how many symmetries total now uh, can, you, can you find for the equilateral triangle? What do you say? Hmm? Three? Five? Nine? Six? So five is a very reasonable answer. So there are three, uh, there are three of these lines of symmetry. And then there are it seems like two rotations, right? I can rotate by 120 degrees, and I can rotate by 240 degrees. Now, I could also rotate by 360 degrees, right? I do three of them, but that's not really doing anything. I'm just rotating the triangle back exactly to it in the same position. But actually, it's a funny thing that mathematicians, uh, we like to consider doing nothing as actually doing something. Okay, so that, that we want to actually consider that as a distinct symmetry of any geometrical object. Every geometrical object, even some crazy wacky one, has at least one symmetry, which is just don't do anything. 
just stay there. That's a nice symmetry. So if you count, you have three lines of symmetry, reflectional lines of symmetry, and then you have two distinct rotations, and then just doing nothing. So I think you have six, six total symmetries. Still got another very nice symmetrical shape, the square. Okay? Square is maybe the first or maybe the second um, highly symmetric geometrical object that we encounter also. And it's a, it's a quadrilateral with all four of its side lengths the same, or all interior angles are 90 degrees. And so if you start trying to play the same game, well, what would you do? How many lines of symmetry do you see in the square? You have those ones, you have those ones, you have also which kind? Diagonal ones. And then what about, are those it for lines of symmetry? What do you think? I think, so. yeah? Rotations. We also have rotations. So you can rotate now, um, and you can, so if you think about it, you can rotate a square, rotate it again, rotate it three times. You have really three different distinct rotations of a square you can make that would bring it back to itself. All right, so how many total symmetries are there? Including the do nothing symmetry. So you have one, two, three, four different uh, reflectional symmetries. So ref lines of symmetry, four different reflections. And then the rotations, you have three different unique ones. And then you have just do nothing. So I would say that there are eight uh, distinct symmetries of the square. So if you keep looking at uh, regular polygons, okay, regular n-gons, for n starting at 3, that's what a regular triangle is, okay, so a regular triangle, uh, I mean a equilateral triangle is a regular 3-gon, a square is a regular 4-gon, and then we like to look at, you know, regular pentagons, so regular 5-gons, 6-gons, and uh, so what we've, if we count just the number of symmetries as a you know, for the two shapes already that we've, we've seen, what do you think? Is there a pattern so far? Yes. What do you think? 2n. 2n. And it turns out that indeed, if you count up for a pentagon, you can look that through each vertex going to its opposite face, there is a reflectional line of symmetry, so that gives you five exactly. And then there are four distinct ways of rotating it around, plus the do nothing thing, so there are ten total for the pentagon. And for the hexagon, you see that through each pair of opposite edges, you can take a reflectional line of symmetry through the center of those opposite <laughs> edges, and also through each pair of opposite vertices, you can also get a reflectional symmetry. So that actually gives you, again, six reflectional symmetries, and then there are six rotations, including the rotation that does nothing. So indeed, that number is really 2 times n so far. Okay? And now if you think of, OK, regular 3, 4, 5, 6 gone, we can get you know, regular 29 gones. We can talk about regular 1,000 gones. And somehow, when we go to the limit, if you look at regular n-gons for n really, really, really large, it starts to look like a circle. I mean, the side lengths are really, really small. And as somehow n goes to infinity, the side lengths shrink to 0, and you just get this nice circular shape. You can think of the regular n-gons as approximations for the circle. So, how many symmetries do you think the circle has? Yeah. An infinite amount. But particularly, if you go by the pattern, how many should it have? Two, infin two times infinite amount. So you think, what? why is that? And if you think of the circle, it's a similar type of situation for the n-gons.
So you have basically two distinct types of symmetries. You have ones which are just, so you look at the center, and you have, you have reflectional symmetries, but they can be really at any angle. Really, at, at any angle emanating from the center, you can have reflectional, reflectional symmetry. So these give you an infinite number of reflectional symmetries uh, of the circle. And then also, if you draw the circle, then you have also the rotational symmetries. And you can rotate by any angle theta. And you'll again get a symmetry of the circle. So there are somehow a circles, almost a circle's worth of symmetries, uh, of reflectional symmetries, and another circle's worth of rotational symmetries. Okay? So in, in a very uh, reasonable and, and, and well-defined manner, there are actually two times infinity. There are kind of two circles worth of symmetries of a circle that you can see kind of from the limit of the symmetries of the n-gon. All right, so if you just look at arbitrary n-gons, not necessarily the regular ones, they start to lose symmetry, right? So if we look at triangles, for example, uh, if we look at an isosceles triangle, so on the left, isosceles means that just two of the side lengths are equal and the third one could be different. So an isosceles triangle, I claim, just has one symmetry. Okay, you can just reflect around one axis, and so you have one reflectional symmetry and just do nothing. So really there are two, uh, there are two symmetries for an isosceles triangle. And if you just look at an, uh, what are they called? Uh, what is that called? Uh, when cycling? Uh, scalene, scalene, oh my goodness. Wow, it's really coming, it's taking me back. Uh, so a scalene triangle, where none of the side lengths are equal, that is kind of very, very unsymmetric triangle. There's really no symmetry, except do nothing. There's no reflectional symmetry. There's no rotational symmetry. So you can see that amongst the triangles, the equilateral one, yeah. Yes? No, go like that. You're asking, are they equal? Yeah. Those two triangles? No, like, there's two lines on the... the oh, you're asking, are the, the, is the top, say the top, the diagonal line and the bottom line, are they equal? No, they're not supposed to be equal in this picture. Do they look equal? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, maybe they're... <laughs> <laughs> Should have made it more extremely non-equal looking. No, they're, they're not supposed to be looking equal. The very good point. If they were equal, then you would get a symmetry, right? Very good. So amongst all the triangles, the three gons, the regular three gons are really, you could say, in a very precise way, are the most symmetric ones. They have the most number of symmetries. They have six, whereas the other ones have only maybe two or one. Similarly, if you look at uh, quadrilaterals, if you think about a rectangle, so then that has two reflectional symmetries. Again, these diagonal ones disappear. And then you can't rotate by 90 degrees, but you can rotate by 180 degrees. And so that gives you, um, so you have two reflectional symmetries rotating by 180 degrees, and then doing nothing, you get four symmetries. And if you take uh, something like this in the middle, so what is this called? A uh, trapezoid? Yeah. Trapezoid? Then you can really only just reflect around this central line. And so you get two symmetries. And otherwise, that one really looks not very symmetric at all. And there's really nothing you can do to it okay, to, to bring it back to itself. So the idea here is that. Somehow regular n-gons are distinguished amongst all the n-gons by their number of symmetries. If I give you a regular n-gon and I tell you its number of symmetries, you can tell me immediately what type it is in this kind of classification. 
And so the principle, the general principle that's underlying this is that symmetry determines geometry. Okay? That in some sense, if you have a geometrical shape or geometrical object, and you want, it's a good thing to look at its symmetries. That helps you actually understand the underlying geometry. And in fact, it can help you uh, determine the underlying geometry. So this is a, actually, it's a much larger uh, program that was basically enunciated in um, the inaugural lecture of Felix Klein. So he, at the age of 23, was uh, made a full professor at the University of uh, Erlangen in Germany in 1872. And kind of when he came in and be he became a professor, he had to give an inaugural lecture. And so the inaugural lecture that he gave was this one, which was a very famous lecture and has been called, uh, after that point, has been called uh, the Erlangen program. Okay? It's, it was he enunciated this idea uh, at this lecture in Erlangen, Felix Klein. He was a 19th century geometer. And the program was basically a formalization of this type of notion, this type of idea, that symmetry should determine geometry, and that we should understand, uh, we should reformulate the axioms and the principles and, and the foundations of geometry in such a way as to uh, build in the symmetry and, and make the symmetry a natural part of the development of the subject, and that actually the symmetry uh, of geometrical objects should be studied right alongside with the, the geometry, and that the symmetry, in fact, determines some of the geometry. Okay, so this, was, um, this is a reproduction of the front cover of the, finally, the published version of, of, um, of his lecture in Erlangen, 1872. All right, so there are three-dimensional versions of the regular polygons, and you've probably seen them. They are very famous. They're called the platonic solids. They're up here also. If you really work hard uh, with, these, with these sticks, you can actually build them. Okay? But it's not, <laughs> it's not so evident if you've tried out there to actually build actually build them. So they have names. Uh, this one is called the tetrahedron. You have the octahedron up there. You have the cube. You know the cube very well. Yeah. And then you have the icosahedron. This one up here. It's made of triangular faces. And the dodecahedron, which is made of uh, pentagon faces. Whew. So these were really important uh, in the history of mathematics. There were actually some uh, Stone Age carvings, uh, rock carvings of some of these. I don't think that the Stone Age people had quite discovered the dodecahedron or the icosahedron, but they had certainly discovered the top three. Basically, they made little uh, carved dice out of them. I mean, I don't know if they played dice with them, but they made little uh, carved uh, sculptures out of them. So they, they clearly understood the, the beautiful geometry um, that was inherent in these objects and that some of them existed. And these just fascinated the ancient world. So in the ancient Greeks, the ancient Greek philosopher Timaeus, um, he decided that we should model the, the four natural elements of the, of the universe uh, on, these ele on, on the platonic solids. So for example, fire, uh, air, earth, water, and somehow in Timaeus's classification, the dodecahedron actually was left out. He just didn't really say anything about the dodecahedron. And then finally, later Plato, and then later Aristotle kind of thought, well, we should add the dodecahedron into this game. And so they decided that we, they should make the dodecahedron a kind of universal organizing principle. It's, it's like a new, a new element, which they called the universe, or which they called the ether. Okay? So, there were many, 
you know, ways of, this was kind of part of early, early uh, cosmology. Um, the uh, 16th century astronomer uh, Kepler had a theory that the six uh, planets that were known at that point, so from Mars up to Saturn, that their orbital uh, lengths and distributions uh, should be modeled on nested uh, platonic solids sitting inside of themselves. So the sun is at the center. Uh, I think he had the octahedron sitting uh, at Mars, and then there's an icosahedron surrounding the octahedron, which is supposed to represent the, the orbit of Venus. Then there's a dodecahedron surrounding the icosahedron, which is supposed to represent the orbit of Earth, and then a tetrahedron surrounding that, which is supposed to represent the orbit of Mars, and then a cube surrounding all of that, which is supposed to represent the orbit of Jupiter, and then around all of that is kind of the shell of the outside of the solar system. You know, you see that in this globe model, which is supposed to be uh, the orbit of Saturn. And so if you think that there are only six planets and you think that the last orbit kind of, you know, is the end of the solar system, then this makes some sense. And I mean, so, okay, Kepler finally, after uh, seeing a lot of evidence to the contrary, abandoned this point of view. But still, these, these, these things really fascinated uh, the ancient world and, and the modern world. So this, this is a uh, image, it's taken, this is a reproduction of a plate uh, from some, uh, some drawings that were made after, some, after the uh, voyage of the HMS Challenger, which was a uh, British Oceanic Expedition that was made in 1872 to 1876, and it was one of the biggest oceanic expeditions at the time. They were trying to get close to uh, the poles. They were trying to collect lots of samples. And one of the things they discovered, they, they got uh, some samples of these, which they named so-called radiolaria. And these are tiny little um, creatures. They're about one... 0.1 millimeter in diameter, and they can form themselves into platonic solids. So their skeleta, you can find uh, icosahedrons, dodecahedrons. Uh, on the upper right, you see, a, you see an octahedron. So this was pretty amazing. I mean, people thought, wow, these things actually exist in the world. They're not just pure, beautiful, geometrical uh, forms of, of, of perfect shapes. These are actually building, some of the building blocks of nature. Yeah. These are real animals. These are real animals. They're tiny. They're point, they're one-tenth of a millimeter in diameter. They are real animals though. If you look at them under a microscope, they look just like that. And they were discovered in 1872. Oh, that's a cross section. So that's, that's, they took one of these and they, cr they took the cross-section. Those are some of the cells that are inside. Uh, the, these, these are kind of protozoa. They have very few numbers of cells, actually, that compose them. All right, so how, first of all, why are there only five? It seems kind of random, right? If you think about what we said in the beginning, and you look at regular polygons in the plane, well, there are infinitely many. There's regular three gons, four gons, five gons, six gons, up to every, you know, all the regular n gons for every n. But somehow in three space, there are only five. So what is a regular, what, what are these regular polyhedra, okay, these platonic solids? So the idea is that you want to construct them as regular as possible. You want shapes, three-dimensional shapes, where all the faces are regular n-gons, and then at, the, at each vertex, the same number of n-gons meet up. And these are, these, you want to construct them in the most symmetric way. What is the most symmetric way you can construct objects? So if you try first to build three-dimensional shapes out of triangles, right, where all the faces are equilateral triangles, well, so what you can do first is with the tetrahedron, you can Imagine that, okay, I can take three triangles 
and have three triangles meet at every vertex. So do you see in the tetrahedron, at every single vertex, there are three equilateral triangles that meet at that vertex. And in fact, it's true that at every single vertex of the tetrahedron, there are exactly three triangles, equilateral triangles that meet. So you can do that. In the octahedron, at every single vertex, there are four equilateral triangles meeting. Okay? If you look at that spinning picture, you see that. You can look at these models. At every single vertex, there are four equilateral triangles meeting. And in the icosahedron, at every single vertex, you see a five-sided shape. There are actually five equilateral triangles meeting at every single vertex. And so you think, oh, great. So let's make one where there's six triangles meeting at every vertex. So what happens there? There is such a shape, but if you put six triangles at a vertex, they form a flat, a flat grid. You can actually tile the plane with vertices with six triangles at every single vertex. You see right there, you look at those vertices, there are six triangles around each vertex, but they don't kind of fold up. They just keep tiling the plane. So that's it. You've run out of space. You can't put six uh, triangles at every vertex and actually have a shape that folds up on itself. So that's it for triangles. That's it for shapes, uh, polyhedra, regular three-dimensional regular three -dimensional polyhedra that are made where each face is an equilateral triangle and that at each point there's the same number of triangles meeting up. So you start to see where the finiteness comes in. Somehow in three dimensions, you just run out of room. Um, okay, what about trying to put squares, so regular foregones, at the vertices? Well, the cube is nice. It has three um, squares at each vertex. It's very nice. So you say, okay, great. What about four squares at each vertex? As again, you run into the same problem. If you try to put four squares at a vertex, they don't fold up. They actually tile the plane. You can put them perfectly into the plane. So you can't put four squares on a vertex and have that shape fold up, up on itself to make a three-dimensional shape. All right, and for the dodecahedron, what you have is, OK, so we're done with squares, right? There's only one shape you can get by, by putting squares on the sides. OK, so what about pentagons? I want to put pentagons on the side. And you see that what is the dodecahedron? It's a shape where at each vertex there are uh, three pentagons okay, meeting, every single one. And then you ask, great, OK, what about four pentagons meeting? Well, if you, try, you see that you can't put four pentagons, even, and they won't even tile the plane. So if you put... Uh, um, so if you see in this picture, what I've tried to illustrate is what happens when you take, if you look at one of, those, uh, one of those vertices in the picture, if you put three pentagons meeting, they, make, they leave a tiny little wedge in space left over. And you can't stuff another pentagon in there. Okay, that's what that kind of flattened out picture is supposed to show you. So there's no way to put four pentagons at every vertex, or even at any vertex in, four, in three space. There's just not enough room in three space to actually accommodate that. And then for six gons, you think, OK, fine. So we're done with regular five gons. OK, what about a shape made out of six gons? Six, OK, what can I do? I can put maybe three six gons at every vertex. Already, though, I tile the plane with six three gons at every vertex. OK, I get the usual honeycomb uh, tiling of the plane. And so that's it. And seven gons and eight gons, you can't even put three of them at any vertex, right? If you think about the interior angles, they just won't, they, they're, they're too much to try to add up. So you cannot put three seven gons at a vertex. You cannot put three eight gons at a vertex. And you just can't build any more of these. That's it. You've just exhausted all of space by trying to build the platonic solids. So that's why there are finitely many of them. And that's why, in particular, there are five of them. So that, that's, that's basically the proof, and that proof is actually, exactly that proof is worked out in, in, play, in uh, Euclid's elements, actually. So it's one of the big highlights of, of, of Euclid's elements of geometry is that um, finally that proof is contained in there.
All right, so if you add up, if you look at these, if you look at these uh, platonic solids and you add up kind of the numbers of uh, vertices, edges, faces, you get these numbers. Okay? You just have to stare at them and add them up. So the tetrahedron has four vertices, six edges, four faces. The octahedron has six vertices, 12 edges, eight faces. And the cube, for example, has eight vertices, 12 edges, six faces. Now there's something actually curious about <coughs> the octahedron and the cube and the dodecahedron and the icosahedron. Do you see something going on there? Yeah. They're both 52? The sum, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> That's very good. Yeah, if you, add up, if you add up the number of total numbers here, you get 52, uh, 62? 62? And what happens here if you add them up? 26? Yeah. Okay, so that's true, that's true. That, but in particular, what's even more than just adding them up and getting them, the numbers are the same. They're just in different orders, right? Yeah. If you look at the octahedron and the cube, it's just the number of edges is actually the same, but the numbers of vertices and faces are just swapped. And the dodecahedron and the icosahedron, the number of edges is the same. The number of vertices and number of faces is just swapped. There's something going on here, which is what we call duality. So some of these platonic solids are so-called duals of the other ones. And here's the idea, is that inside of a cube, you can stick, well, this one's a little big, but inside of a cube, you can stick an octahedron where exactly at the center of each face of the cube, you can put a vertex of the octahedron. Okay? And that shows you that the vertices and faces kind of correspond uh, by going from flipping between cube and octahedron. And conversely, given an octahedron, that's what that upper right picture is trying to show, given an octahedron, you can stick actually a square inside and so that at the center of every single face, there's a vertex of the cube the fact that you can stick one in the other and stick the one in the other, this is what we call dual. These are dual objects. And in particular, anything you do to one, you do to the other, because they're both kind of nested inside of each other. So for example, the symmetries of the octahedron and the symmetries of the cube are actually, they're the same, because every symmetry of the cube, you spin the cube around, but inside there's an octahedron, and you'll spin that around, and inside that there's a cube, you'll spin that around. Okay, and then for these two dual shapes, you see again the same thing happens, <coughs> that inside of an icosahedron, you can stick a dodecahedron, so that exactly the, each vertex of the dodecahedron touches exactly at the center of each face of the icosahedron, and conversely, inside of a dodecahedron, you can stick an icosahedron and so that each vertex hits exactly at the center of the face of the dodecahedron. So these two are actually dual to each other. Here's another kind of weird dual relationship between uh, various platonic solids. So the cube and the dodecahedron are not dual to each other. But magically, you can take uh, a dodecahedron and then fold it up to make a cube. And conversely, you can take a cube and cut it up and refold it to make a dodecahedron. So there are kind of, these, these platonic solids all kind of have strange relationships to each other. And, and uh, really investigating them and, and exploring them is, is, is really is something quite fascinating. Okay. So, what about their symmetries? It's a little, so what did we do first with the regular n-gons when we were trying to enumerate the symmetries? What was the first type of symmetry that we just jumped out at us, right? They were the lines of reflection. Now here, I think what's a, a, a nice way to think about the symmetries, the first type of symmetries, are the lines of rotation. Because you're in three space now. You can rotate through an axis. Okay? So for example, 
take the tetrahedron. There are two different types of rotational symmetries. You can f take, a take the tetrahedron and you can take a pair of opposite edges and take a line that runs through the center of those opposite edges. Okay, that's what that picture on the upper left is, is depicting. And then you can rotate about that line 180 degrees. If you rotate about that line 180 degrees, you will exactly move the tetrahedron back to itself. So there are, you know, however many faces there are, uh, six. And so there are three pairs of opposite faces. And so there are three of these types of rotations for the tetrahedron. And then what about these? You can also, through every vertex, there's an opposite face. And you can take a line that goes through the vertex and then out through the center of the opposite face. And then there, what you're doing is you can rotate, but now you don't rotate 180 degrees, you rotate by 120 degrees. You rotate you know, a third of the way around a triangle. I mean, around a circle. So you rotate one third, one third. And so there are basically two distinct rotations for every pair of, uh, for every vertex, and then its opposite edge. So, so there are four vertices, and each one gives you two distinct rotations emanating from that vertex. So you have eight total rotations of this type. Okay? So if you're counting so far, you have uh, three rotations coming from the, uh, from the pairs of opposite edges. You have eight rotations coming from each vertex through the opposite face. And then you have doing nothing. So how many total symmetries do we have? Twelve, exactly. So indeed, the tetrahedron has 12 rotational symmetries. And you can do the same kind of analysis for cubes, OK? So for cubes, you have, for example, opposite faces. Now you can rotate, again, by 180 degrees, do the opposite faces. So you have to count up the number of faces, divide by 2. You get the number of, of those types of rotational symmetries. Through the opposite vertices now, you have actually pairs of opposite vertices. And here, if you look straight through, I don't know if you can see this, you look straight through uh, the, the opposite vertices, because there are three squares that meet at that vertex, you can rotate one third of the way around the circle. So for each pair of opposite vertices, you can rotate exactly twice. There are two distinct rotational symmetries. And so you count up the number of uh, vertices, you divide by two, and then you multiply by two because you get two distinct rotations for each one. And then there are other types. There's one other type, which is you go through pairs of opposite faces. If you draw a line through the center of opposite faces, you can rotate now um, four times, right? Or really three distinct times. You can rotate one quarter of the way around the circle, and you can get for each pair of opposite faces, which there are three on a cube, you can get three distinct rotations that way. So if you've been counting up so far, how many is that total? <laughs> and then here's what's going on for the dodecahedron. Okay, you have a similar story. You have, um, you have pairs of opposite edges. You can rotate uh, 180 degrees. You have the picture starts to get a little more difficult. So you have pairs of opposite vertices. You can rotate uh, a third away around the circle because you have three pentagons meeting there. And then you have pairs of opposite faces, which you can rotate, which because each face is a pentagon, you have five things. You can rotate one-fifth of the way around the circle and still get a symmetry. So again, you have to count up all those things. And you get these numbers. Okay. So already we got 12 for the tetrahedron. Okay. We got hmm? 120. 120, exactly. So if you actually keep track of what's going on here with those three different types, 
pairs of opposite vertices, pairs of opposite edges, pairs of opposite faces. Since there are a lot of vertices, edges, and faces, you start multiplying out the total number and you get 120. And actually, we didn't do the analysis. We only did the analysis for the tetrahedron and the cube and the dodecahedron. And what about the other three? Or the other two, sorry? The octahedron and the icosahedron? Why don't we need to do the analysis for those? Somebody said it. Because they're dual, right? They're dual, so th the icosahedron is dual to the dodecahedron, and so any symmetry, if you think of sticking the icosahedron inside of the dodecahedron, right? Each time you do, for example, one of these face-to-face uh, -face five-fold rotational symmetries, you're doing, because there's at the center of each face, there's a vertex of the icosahedron sitting at the center of each face. We are doing the face-to-face -face rotation on this embedded icosahedron. You're actually doing a vertex-to-vertex -vertex rotation. Okay? And so you can do five of those going around. So that's... Is, you have a question? With the, 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 this yes. one, the dodecahedron, yeah. If you put the icosahedron inside of that, yes. and, then, and then add another face to the ico, uh, icosahedron, dexto... The dodecahedron, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. Would that mean like there would be one left over, so there would be like one more of those? Or would that, or if there were one more, uh, one more face on the icosahedron, Ah, so, oh, you're saying if you tried to add another, another face in, yes, both to both of them simultaneously somehow. Yes, well, I mean, that goes back to, yeah, it's a, I mean, it goes back to what we were saying uh, earlier, which is this, exact, this analysis here, right, which is that as you try to add, exactly, it's as you try to add one face, one extra face, you know, meeting at every vertex to, say, the icosahedron, at the same time, you would have to also add another face meeting to the dodecahedron. And you just couldn't do it. Neither of them can you do it. So that's, that's really what, yeah, I mean, both, kind of, both shapes give you constriction. And, uh, let's see, and the cube, if you look at the cube and the uh, oh, I didn't do the analysis for the uh, octahedron. See all the octahedrons there. So for the cube and the octahedron, uh, as you're, I guess, as you're adding one face, yeah, it's a funny thing. As you're adding one more face to the cube, you get this plane. And I guess, no, well, okay, the cube. I guess I see what's, well, I guess what's just happening is that you, you can add one more face to the, to the cube, you'll get this tiling, and then the, the, I, the dodecahedron, or the, uh, what am I trying to say, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the octahedron will just sit, you see how it has, the octahedron has a square in it, right? Kind of in sitting inside, if you think of, the octahedron is like two pyramids, there's one pyramid on top and there's another pyramid below, and they meet exactly in a square. So I think that's going to be that square that you would get by, by trying to add uh, one, more, one more square to the uh, cube while having the octahedron embedded inside the cube. It's, it's a good, I never thought of it that way. Was that your question? Okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> Or was that an answer to your question? 
Uh, OK. So let's see. Yeah, OK. So we get these numbers. And um, lying, so I want to come back a little bit to, uh, to Klein's Erlangen program. So underlying these numbers, there's not just the number of symmetries. Okay, so if we think of all of the symmetries uh, of, of each of these shapes, and even of the regular n-gons, actually you can do things to symmetries. So you can do a symmetry, and then you can do another symmetry. And because each time you do a symmetry, you uh, bring the shape back to itself, if you do two symmetries, one after the other, you will still bring the shape back to itself. So doing one symmetry and then doing another symmetry will give you yet a third symmetry. But if you know all the symmetries, what you're just getting is a kind of multiplication law on symmetries. So you can take one symmetry, you can multiply it, quote unquote, multiply it by another one. That means you just do one after the other. And then you'll get yet a third one. That's just a symmetry again. So these have, um, these, these symmetries have a kind of algebra structure. There's a kind of algebra that you can attach to the set of symmetries. Okay, and so each, so the set of symmetries um, has a multiplication. Okay, by just taking one symmetry, doing another symmetry. And this structure that, um, that exists on the set of symmetries is what mathematicians call um, a group. Okay, so it turns out that the set of symmetries of any object, any, any type of structure, uh, forms what mathematicians call a group. It's basically just the most um, elemental way you can think about formally, just you think about the rules of multiplication, and what can you do with multiplication? You can, you, you know, you can multiply, you can, if you have an equation, you can multiply both sides by the equation. Uh, if you have, you know, you can maybe uh, multiply by the inverse of things on both sides of an equation. Uh, there's all, all those things you learn about algebra, algebra, quote unquote, of numbers, you can do actually with symmetries. You can, if you have an equation between two symmetries, you can multiply that equation on both sides by another symmetry and you'll still get an, uh, an equation between symmetries. It's a very nice and convenient way to think of um, the symmetries. Okay. And now, because all of these platonic solids live in three-dimensional space, what Klein's Erlangen program it would tell you, or is telling you, or, or, or kind of leads you to consider, is the fact that the symmetries of platonic solids are somehow inside of the symmetries of all of three space. Okay? So if we just think of three space, you know, where we live as an actual geometrical object, you know, you can move in this direction, you can move in that direction, you can move backwards. It actually has a it, I mean, it is a geometry, and it has a symmetry group, too. And what we're saying is that the, actually, these, all of these symmetries of the various uh, regular polygons, uh, regular uh, polyhedra, is if you think of the origin of our three space as sitting in the very center of these regular polyhedra, each of these is given by some type of rotation, actually, that fixes the origin all these fix, the, the rotations of all of these fix the origin. And so, in fact, 
the symmetry and the symmetries these are these are particular versions of symmetries that exist in three space just like uh, for the regular n-gons in two space the symmetries of the regular n-gons are particular cases of just symmetries of all of two space and the 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 group of all symmetries of three space is something which mathematicians uh, this is called SO3. Okay, it has a specific name. It's called SO3. And it's a beautiful object. And it, uh, uh, coming along in Klein's program, understanding the symmetries of three space helps you to understand three space. And one way to, I think, very nicely think of the classification of platonic solids is, well, we, we, what did we do before? We did a case-by-case -case analysis basically on how many uh, polygons can fit at a given edge and we, you know, we, we, ruled out, we ruled out various possibilities. But another very beautiful way of, of understanding the fact that there are only five of them is that if you look at this group, SO3, as a mathematician, and you realize Klein's program, the Erlangen program, is kind of telling you that you should think of the symmetries of the platonic solids as sitting inside of the symmetries of SO3. And furthermore, that all of these symmetries, there's just finitely many of them. For each given platonic solid, it only has finitely many symmetries. So then you just ask, well, what are all the finite subgroups of the group SO3? And it turns out that they are exactly classified by the, the uh, symmetry groups of the platonic solids. And also in SO3, you also, in 3-space, you also have 2-space sitting inside 3-space. So you also have all the regular n-gons sitting in 2-space. And all of their symmetries are also, you can think of as symmetries inside of 3-space. So you also have all the symmetry groups of the regular polygons. And in fact, you can prove, as a mathematician, you can prove that those exactly exhaust the finite subgroups of SO3. So if you look at all symmetries of 3-space, the finite subgroups of that only correspond to the regular polygons in 2-space and then the, the platonic solids in 3-space. And somehow, that's, that's it. There's no other. So again, this is a reflection of this of this Erlangen program that's saying that somehow symmetry determines geometry. The fact that there are only these finite subgroups inside the symmetry group of all of three space determines the fact that there are only these uh, finite number of platonic solids and only those uh, kinds of, of regular n-gons in two space. Uh, so I think that it's, and it, it's a, I mean, it's, it's a, it, it was a really, important philosophy, Klein's philosophy, and it, it made a big impact on, on mathematics in the 19th and all through the 20th century on mathematics and physics. And nowadays, I mean, it's not, it's completely unthinkable that we would consider a geometrical uh, object or a physical system and not uh, consider as an integral part of the study of it, its symmetries. Okay, so I guess what I'm trying to say here is that the, uh, the symmetries of the platonic solids really help you to understand them. And I have to say that I taught a class, so last year I taught a class here at Yale, which was called Reflection Groups. So it's all about, essentially the first three weeks of the course, uh, four weeks of the course, is about the platonic solids and their symmetry groups. And doing these calculations about the numbers of them and what kind of structure the symmetries have, more fine-grained analysis, like we did today. Basically, the students told me after the first month, you know, I pick, I've been picking these things up since I was a kid. You know, there are toys that are made out of icosahedra. There, there are all kinds of... But I never really understood very much about it until I was forced to do problems that had to do with the symmetry. And it's true, I mean, for me too, somehow even becoming a, a, you know, a, a professor maybe in, in mathematics, I mean, until learning and then teaching about the material, it, I never really 
understood how beautiful these shapes were until I was forced to really be confronted with their symmetries. And uh, the, uh, the, the structure that they have and the kind of relationships that they have to each other. So I guess that's a, uh, that is a sign that I should uh, stop the talk. Thank you. <laughs> Ah, that's, I mean, that's a good point. So, the why, why is the sphere not a platonic solid, right? Well, it's, it's interesting. I mean, in some sense, um, you know, we viewed the circle as a limit of regular n-gons, right? So, we could use, we could view the symmetries of the circle as a limit of the symmetries of the regular n-gons. But, you know, there are only finitely many platonic solids, so there's no infinite limit you can take of them to get to the sphere. Okay, still, that's not an answer to your question. Um, I guess we don't even really consider the circle to be a regular n-gon. It's, it's kind of a, it's just a limit of regular n-gons. And I would say that about the circle, it it's somehow useful, it contains all the platonic solids. I mean, you can, you know, in enclose any platonic solid in a circle. But somehow it has so many symmetries, the circle, uh, the sphere, the two-sphere itself, that first of all, it's definitely infinite, and it's a lot more infinite, and, it, and you can't really understand it as a, as a kind of limit of, of symmetries coming from platonic solids. It's, it's just a much more complicated object, I think. That would be the answer I would give. Yeah? You know who invented gamma geometry? Who invented geometry? I would say that uh, geometry was already, was probably first seriously thought of when the advent of agriculture started. <laughs> because somehow, once you start planting things in a field, you need to start thinking about the structures of your fields and how they, you know, how your farm meets other farms. And I, I, probably that was the first time that people were really confronted with uh, the, the need to consider geometry. So, I'm not sure if there's any one person who I would say invented geometry, but it comes, I probably comes from agriculture. Uh, so all the ancient civilizations had some understanding of geometry. If you want to build a house, you need to understand geometry. If you want to make measurements of the lengths of something, you need to understand geometry. If you want to build a pyramid, you definitely need to understand geometry. So all these ancient civilizations definitely had an innate understanding of geometry. As far as, you know, our modern day understanding of geometry, I mean, certainly Euclid, Pythagoras, I mean, these uh, ancient Greeks, there's also um, a lot of geometry development in the ancient Chinese world, ancient Persian world. It was all kind of coming together at the same time, probably in the ancient world. Yeah, the animals. Yeah, they are weird, right? Let's look at those again. Yeah, they, they live in the ocean. They live right here in our oceans. So they live in the Atlantic Ocean. They are kind of just drifting around. But they do, they do eat. Uh, you can see their mouth. You see the mouth? It's right in the middle. They do eat stuff. But they're tiny. They're really tiny. It would be scary if they were big, but they're tiny, tiny. Yeah. Yes. Smaller 
soccer ball? No. So that's a very nice question. Um, it is one of these so-called Archimedes solids. Uh, so let me see if I can come up. So okay, sorry. The question is okay. So the question is first was the um, observation that I think we're back here. Uh, the observation that the so remember these two came in a kind of dual pair, the octahedron and the cube, and the icosahedron and the dodecahedron. They're kind of dual to each other, but it kind of leaves out leaves out the tetrahedron. It's kind of by itself. But you could think of well, what thing can you stick inside the tetrahedron? You know, if you try to exchange the vertices and faces, you just still get the same number of vertices and faces. So really what's happening is that if you put a dot in the middle of every single face of a tetrahedron, you can put another tetrahedron inside of it, a smaller one, and on and on. So somehow the dual of a tetrahedron is just itself a tetrahedron. So tetrahedra are kind of self-dual. And you can ask about the duality uh, between any type of uh, polyhedron in three space. So one very common one is the soccer ball. Soccer ball is made out of, um, what is it, a pentagon with five hexagons? Or is it a hexagon with five pentagons? Hex it's pentagons surrounded by hexagons. And then you, so it's not a regular, it's not a, it's not a platonic solid because not every single face is the same type of uh, regular polygon, but it's almost a platonic solid. Quasi, they call it quasi-regular uh, polyhedra, maybe. And it's made out of two regular um, polygons. And it's, it, these are also very beautiful shapes, and once you start to, ask, well, what are all the, sh the you know, regular type of polyhedra you can make with two shapes or three shapes? The zoo of them starts to really explode, and there are many, many different types. So if you look, uh, on the, for example, on the Wikipedia page of Archimedes solids, you will find this nice list of them, and one of them is the soccer ball. And so you can describe the dual of the soccer ball as, as one of these Archimedes solids. I don't remember exactly what it is. It's... Uh, it, it has triangular faces, but um, I think, yeah, it has, well, we could look it up after the talk. Yeah? Uh, in two space, we looked at both rotational symmetry and reflectional symmetry. Is there any utility or what, what happens when you start looking at three space and reflecting across the plane? Absolutely. That is a very good question. So just to... To simplify things, I was only considering uh, the rotational symmetries in three space when I was describing um, these symmetries. But in fact, there are also reflectional symmetries. So you have to think of taking one of these platonic solids and slicing it with a plane and hope that it's a mirror image on both sides of that plane. So each time you can find a plane that kind of slices a platonic solid exactly in half, that will give you a type of reflective symmetry. And so the reflection symmetries also you can classify. So you can slice, for example, on a tetrahedron, you can slice through a vertex uh, and through an edge, and that's basically it. And on a cube, you can slice, for example, this way, or you can slice this way, and that's basically it. And then on a icosahedron, there's a lot more different slices you can make. But it turns out, every time you do this, it seems like you add a lot more things, but what happened with the regular n-gons? Right? If we just considered the rotations, there are n of them, including doing nothing. And then what happens if we considered all rotation, I mean all symmetries, including the reflections? We got 2n. And so actually the exact same thing happens here is that if you look at these numbers, these are the numbers of rotational symmetries. And if we wanted to know the number of ref all symmetries, including reflectional symmetries, you just double each of these numbers, it turns out. It's a very good question. Yes? In 
Well, that's a very good question. Uh, yeah, here is probably the expert on that. Um, there are, but they they can tend usually to be infinite. Uh, I mean, you have these triangles, like ideal triangles, uh, and ideal, say, n-gons, but then you also have these kind of infinite versions. Um, and as far as yeah, in you in in hyperbolic three space. You definitely have uh, versions of uh, platonic kind of solids in hyperbolic three space. All the finite subgroups of the. It's the same SO3. It's the same SO3, yeah. So but all the things, all the illegal things you stopped doing when you ran and you had not enough room to put in, what was it, five squares or seven hexagons, and you stopped the discussion, all of those actually work in hyperbolic. That's right. Science. You have a lot more room. You have a lot more room because you measure things differently there. So uh, you you can uh, you have more angle. There's there's more room. Like triangles, for example, are much different. I mean, we're used to the fact that the interior angles of a triangle have to sum up to 180 degrees, and I think in hyperbolic plane it's not true, right? So you have more room, literally speaking. You can the measurement of of area and, and distance is, is different, so you can get more of them. Very good. Yes? I think you have to talk with Michael Frame about that. Um, what, there are fractional dimensional geometrical objects. They usually look like fractals. And I imagine there is a theory of, I mean, you can talk about the, uh, the symmetry group of a fractional dimensional space. And you can ask for, like in Klein's program, you can ask for the finite subgroups of it. And I don't know if people have done that for if particular. It lives inside three dimensional space. Then have to be, have to be to parts of, yeah. Kind of have, one that's have one that's not embeddable. Yeah, it, it, it's a funny question. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what to say. Yeah, it's a good question. Okay, let's, let's thank Asher again. Thank you.